couple things. So let's see, we won't do our usual recap and everything that we normally do this week, just because I want to be able to allow Sherry enough time to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Sherry has actually um, also worked in our, our San Joaquin offices over the mm -hmm. last several years. And then she went back, she is a broker. So she has her own, had her own business. And now she um, is with us at Keller Williams again, and also an investor and um, running an office in the Lockford out of Lockford, which is right next to Lodi, if you don't know. So um, I'm, I heard through the grapevine that she has been using the buyer representation um, compensation agreement. So it's the BRBC. Um, and so she, I said, Sherry, can you talk about this? Because honestly, the, the over the, I've been in this business, as you've all heard, about almost 21 years. And at, during, we never used it when I started. And then I've even heard statistics, oh, only about 10, 15% of the agents ever use it. And so I thought, oh, I'm okay. I don't use it because <laughs> um, I was in the other 85%. Uh, but due to the recent um, lawsuits and all that fun stuff going on in the industry, I do recommend you use it. How many of you took advantage of the free course by any chance that I sent out last week through CAR? Good job, John. Anybody else? Yeah, I joined. I just registered myself for this by representation. You took, you took the class? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So if you haven't, Sherry's going to cover something right now, but I still encourage you to take that class because it's at your own pace. You can take your notes and it's just a lot of information that we might not be able to cover all in our, our small amount of time. So please take advantage of that. You sign on to CAR.org and it's all over there. Free class, BRBC. It's a contract that I believe our industry is going to really adopt. Um, and I encourage you all to adopt it now since you're just starting your business and you won't be like me having to learn it 21 years in. Mm -hmm. So I really encourage you to adopt it. I, I highly encourage you. I cannot make you your independent contractors, but the office may at some point really regulate that you adopt it as well. So just adopt it. <laughs> okay. Okay, Sherry, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Tell them how long you've been in the business and you know those kind of fun things, please. About as long as you have, Barbara. I didn't know that. We <laughs> entered about the same time, got my license in 2003. I've worked with several different companies over the years. Um, I was president of the Lodi Association. That's about a six year term. And during that, you get to be a director with the California Association of Realtors. So that, that was 10 years ago, 2013 is when I was president. Um, so I love learning. I'm a know-it-all. I want to know it all. And so I kind of went back and asked if I could be a director again. And I've been a, a California Association of Realtors director for the past um, three years now. So I sit on the investment housing committee and some of the other things. And trust me, sometimes, oh my God, my ADHD will not allow me just to sit still while they wordsmith some words and stuff like that. But it really does help me to keep on top of what's coming down. And I have been hearing about this buyer broker thing for three years straight. So we are kind of now as agents getting more immersed into what's been going on. But it has been huge, huge. Many states have made lots of changes. They've already um, started to make corrective measures. Um, it's unfortunate the lawsuit went the way it did. I did not expect that, but we are all going to see changes. And so it's one of those things that when Barbara and I were talking about this, um, I, I don't want to, because I'm not qualified to go in and teach you guys the um, BRBC. I didn't even, I, I'm still getting used to that's what it's called, the buyer broker um, compensation agreement. But I can tell you what I'm doing. Okay? And I, it is one thing that I, because I'm a team leader, I mandate that my team everybody gets one of these. And I, I want to go through with it with you, like what we do, how we practice it, right? So like Barbara said, we're all independent contractors. You all have a choice on what you choose to do or not. What I hope to do here today is to give you some practical applications, because I can tell you my whole career in doing real estate, I hated this form and I didn't want to do it because in my heart, I felt like if I don't express my value to you and you choose to go somewhere else, that's on me. And so I never wanted to tie somebody into this. Now, I wouldn't do that with a listing agreement, right? Would you all agree? You're not going to take a listing. And I don't want to do an open listing. And I don't want to do one that's not exclusive. But when it comes to a buyer, and I've even taught the new member orientation class. And the way I explained it is I've always felt like buyers are like free range chickens. And so you go out there and you either capture them or you don't. You express your value or you don't. Because of the lawsuit, I have changed in how I feel. So now I have to express that to my clients, right? And it's not so much that I still don't feel that exact same way. I do. I feel like I have a job to teach clients now. And that's what, in my opinion, this whole lawsuit is doing. It's forcing us agents to have conversations with buyers that we've never had before. You would never go into a listing agreement and not talk about what your compensation is going to be. It always comes up, right? Because they're going to be paying it. They're going to talk to you about it. So it's the same thing that's going to happen with our buyers. Now, at some point, you're going to have to have a conversation about compensation unless you guys are doing volunteer work and you want to work for free. 
Like, and I don't think anybody here in this conversation wants to volunteer or work for free when it comes to real estate and working with buyers. It's too hard, right? That's correct. So if we all agree that we're not working for free and we're not doing it for funsies, right? Because some buyers just like to go look, well, we're not doing it for funsies. It's a job. And I can tell you, there's lots of times in 21 years now, I think it is in doing this. There are certain times when I know when I'm showing a buyer a home, it's going to be for fun, but I'm looking at the future value either of their other family members, or at some point I know they're going to buy, right? So that's decisions you guys are going to have to make. But when it comes to my team, when we're working for a buyer, we're now using the buyer broker compensation, right? So if you pull up that form, and I would really like you guys all go online, you're all are, I can see most of you are sitting at a computer or something, pull up, go into zip forms, pull up that buyer broker agreement. The first part of the form is going to talk about the agency relationship. I think it's going to blur out. Okay. It's going to talk because that's the first thing that California dictates that we talk to our clients about. They have to know who's representing who. So that's, and some of the other stuff, the equal housing, the fair housing, um, the possibility of representing more than one buyer or seller. There we go. Pull up that one, Barbara, that one page. That this, one, this one. Yep. Yes, that one. And so this form here, this first page is, in my opinion, the whole meat and potatoes of this whole form. And this is the one where your clients are going to have questions. The rest of it is like, I'm sorry, Bruce would need, it's more like yada, yada, yada. They don't really care so much. Okay. I want you to get comfortable with this first page. Can you um, expand that one? That one that's highlighted right there? Right here, the top or the whole page? The one you have highlighted says BRBC with highlighted highlights. Oh, oh, you know that what? Um, okay, let me, I think it, I did, but it didn't share. So let me go back okay. in. So I can see it. <laughs> okay, there we okay go. now right. you can see it. <laughs> so this is an example of, I'm not dictating to you guys what to do, right? Okay, so I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you, this is what I teach my team to do, okay? So this is my favorite buyer. His name is Rich Person, okay? <laughs> so that's obvious. You have to put specifically who it is you're working with. You have to put their names. Who are they? It's husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, who, who can, over 18, anybody can sign a contract, their name goes there. The other thing I do is the first part that's highlighted where it says 180 days. The beginning date is going to be the date whenever you pick that, right? It could be today's date, the date you're going to sign it, whatever it is you choose. I put 180 days on there because that's what I do with my listing agreements. So I mirror it the same. Well, and for this, I figured six months, it's going to go for six months. I might be it, you may even choose to go 10 months. And in this market, I'm almost thinking to extend it out to that. But that's how long I want this agreement to be. So you pick that date. But it's, I highlighted it because it's important. You, in my opinion, would not want to put three days, two days, seven days, anything like that. Not even the length of an escrow. Okay, the next one is on item three where it says property to be acquired. And it's asking you specifically for it. Now, I work, I put California on there because I work with a lot of investors who don't just buy in one city or in one county or two. And actually where I'm located in Lockford, it's really close to Sacramento County and San Joaquin County and Stanislaus and Calaveras and Tuolumne. So the other thing I would do is if I had a buyer that I knew was going in one or two counties, I would put San Joaquin County or Sacramento County. So you check the box right here and then put counties of San Joaquin, Sacramento, Tuolumne, yep. whatever it is. Right. So like Barbara's saying, list those out there. It's better. They're recommending that you put something more specific than California. But I have to say that if, if somebody were to argue with me about this, I could tell them who my buyer was and where they were looking. And that's why I had to be broader than the counties. But um, responsibility-wise, it's better to be a little bit more detailed. But I would never tell my team to be locked into one address. You're defeating the purpose of this. So okay. go broad, put counties in. So the other thing is, the next thing is we're going to have to talk about compensation and you're going to have to put something here. And I've actually had a team member who wanted to leave that. So we're going down to 4A. So on there, she didn't want to put anything because she didn't want the buyer to feel like they were obligated to pay. I thought, well, do you want to get paid? You have to put something in there. And so what are what's the minimum you're, you're looking to go for? And so what the agent said to me when we had this conversation, she said, well, what if, and I'm just playing a what if game. What if um, the MLS only gave 2%? And I said, well, if that happened and we had a buyer sign this, I said, would you be willing to lower your commission? And she said, yes. I said, then all you have to do is do a modification and we lower it. So if your buyer has an objection to the amount that you put in there, what I'm saying to them is this form is something that we have been doing, that I particularly have been doing for 20 years. But because of the lawsuit that's gone out, we're now having to put it in writing. So that's all I'm doing. And to be honest with you, that's exactly how I'm presenting it. It's, it's not a big deal. The more comfortable you are with this form, the more comfortable your buyers are going to be in signing it and less suspicious. Like, what is this? 
what do you do? What am I locked into? Right. So if I can get you to feel comfortable with what it is that you're asking them to do, it's going to go a long ways. And when I'm explaining it to the client, you guys can just imagine what it was like the first time you got anybody to sign the con the very first contract that you did. And maybe some of you haven't even gotten to that point yet. You're either going to oversell it or undersell it, right? Because you're uncomfortable. You don't know. But I can tell you the more comfortable I can get you with this form right here, the more comfortable your clients are going to be, no matter who you're representing, a buyer or a seller. And the other thing is you don't have to know it all to be able to explain this, right? So this is exactly the way that we have been doing business for years, but because of the lawsuit that you may or may not have heard about, now I'm having to have you sign a form like this, right? And so all it's saying is that I'm not working for free. And I even joke with my clients and say for funsies. And then I say, you know, even though I do enjoy you and stuff, it is a job. And so this is how I'm going to get paid. And so the amount goes in there. You can negotiate that amount however you want. Right. And I want to let you guys know, too, even though you sign an agreement like this, you have a choice to lower that amount. You can't unilaterally increase that amount, but you can unilaterally lower that amount with your broker's approval. Right. OK. So the other thing that I have highlighted here is the big things that you want to look at. How do you want to do business? You're either going to be checking box two, and that's where I've highlighted that mark, or you're going to be just not checking anything, and it's going to be box one. Okay. So I'm going to read a little bit about what box one says, and it talks about broker's involvement, and it's non-inclusive. Okay. And it says compensation is payable only if there was a broker involved um, with the property. And then it goes on to list what broker involved means. This is the same type of terminology that we use when we get paid a compensation when we're representing a buyer. When you hear about, um, oh my gosh, the thing just uh, compensate when we're compensated, uh, procuring cause. You guys have all heard about procuring cause before, right? Say a buyer. Maybe not have. You. You, you, you want to explain it? Explain it, please. Okay. So a lot of times when there's arguments over who's getting paid, when somebody feels like they're representing the same buyer, they, they, the, our um, code of ethics goes into what the procuring cause is and who is allowed to get paid if we don't have a form like this signed. So let's do, and I've done this before. I, I talked to the client, I sent them a home, I showed them the home, and then they decided to have the listing agent write the offer. And so I went to the listing agent and I pleaded my case. And I was a new agent and she pretty much just let me know, good for you. But she was representing them and she was getting the commission. And so that pissed me off enough to where I'm like, you know, I'm going to learn this because uh, I felt like I worked hard and I earned it. And I probably could have filed a complaint and gotten it because I was the procuring cause in that case. I told the client about the property. I showed them the property. I did everything. But I felt I didn't, I wasn't able to um, express my value enough for the buyer to allow me to write the offer. So one of the things I've done too, going along with procuring cause, had a friend of mine bring their son along and asked me to help them find a home because they had been working with a younger agent and it was the daughter of somebody I went to high school with and they just felt like they were going nowhere. And so they let me know that they saw a home in Valley Springs and I looked at it and I thought this home was perfect for him. Why didn't they, why didn't he want to make an offer on it? So I asked him about it. He says, well, eh, it just needed work and they moved on and he's looking, looking, looking. So I asked him, I said, look, I want us to go back and look at that home again and I want you to look at it a little differently. I want to go with you. I said, but in order for me, then, if you want me to represent you, you're going to have to fire your other agent because she's already shown you the home. And I kind of went into procuring cause, right? So even though she showed him the home in the first place, I went back and showed him first, asked him if he liked it or not. I was able to point out all kinds of things. It was one of the biggest homes he'd looked at. And yes, it needed work, but big deal. Carpet and paint is nothing compared to not getting a home or having a 900 square foot home compared to a 1300 square foot home on a half an acre, right? So you guys could see how... I was expressing my value. I wasn't talking him into something, but I told him now, if I'm going to write this offer, I need you to fire your agent. And all he had to do was just send her a text and let her know he was choosing not to work with her any longer and that somebody else was going to represent him. And so I was able to submit the offer and get paid. Had he not fired his other agent, she would have been entitled to the commission. Okay. Can I, share, I just want to add something. I, I also share with them that they should send it as an email because it's a little more, it's more... I don't know how to say it. It's more validating on it it to send it that way. Copy, mm -hmm. copy yourself, copy the other agent, copy the buyer or whoever that person is involved so that everyone is in that loop where texts get lost. And I know through when we hear the lawyer come in for a car, he mm -hmm. usually will defer to an email than a text. So I, I would suggest that. 
And Barbara's absolutely right. In this case, I this was a younger guy that wouldn't do it. So what I did was I got him to do what, what I could. I knew he wouldn't call her because he it was too confrontational, right? And you're going to have clients that just don't want to do it. I knew he could, you know, it's a breakup thing, right? Yeah. So he did a breakup thing in a text. And then I followed up with an email. So I had it in writing and she was aware. And I just, because I was being a professional too. Look, I didn't try to steal your client. This was some friends of mine's son. You know, I went into the whole thing because I'm I'm sure someday I plan on being in business a little while longer. Her and I may be working together again. And I don't want her to think I'm out poaching her clients. So just as a professional, I followed up with that email. Okay. But sometimes, like I said, depending on who your client is, you're not going to get best case scenario. So our fiduciary responsibility is to follow up with it. And in this case, that part about following up had to do with me protecting the commission, because like Barbara said, they could have argued around it if they wanted. And I just want it to be clear. You know, I don't want to go into not knowing this stuff is stressful enough. Okay. So to be honest with you guys, if you can get a buyer to fill this form out and you don't do anything else, but put the stuff I just talked about ahead of time and you don't check any other box, this is exactly the way we have been doing business for the past 20 years, non-exclusive representation. So if a buyer signs this, they're not getting locked into anything, right? Other than the amount that they're going to pay you, which if you explain to them, if the seller's going to offer me less, I'm going to honor that. And all I have to do is send you a modification of terms. And I'm going to do that for you. Why would I not want to do that? So I have a question. So you said non-exclusive, but do you mean exclusive? No, right there. Because oh, I see the X. Okay, right. So I haven't gotten down to that part yet. Okay, so just want to make sure. Okay. Form, yeah, and you don't check that box. That's where I have that pin mark because that's your. this is where you guys are going to choose how you want to do business. Okay, but I want you to understand the way we, and like what Barbara talked about, this is the way we've always been doing business is with box number two, not checked. So this should not be as mu as hard for us to do because it's the only difference is we're one, expressing our value to the buyer. And so they know how we're paid. We don't work for free, right? And so so that's kind of what it's doing. And um, it's it doesn't have to be exclusive, okay? So on the second part, now, if you want it to be exclusive, which means no matter what that buyer buys, you're gonna get paid, you check that box, okay? And so I check that box, right? Because I know that if a client asks me about that, says, well, what do you mean? Well, what if I do this? And what, if, you know, they play the what if game. What if I do this? What if I do that? Okay. And so I'm going to tell them, well, look at the next item, item number C1. What it says is we can cancel this agreement. If you decide you don't like working with me, or if I don't like working with you, either one of us can cancel this agreement, right? But if I have done my due diligence and I've worked really hard for you, and that's what I plan on doing. Like I plan on running circles around any agent you have ever been with. That's my goal. And I want to make you so happy. You can't help but refer me three of your friends. That's my goal. That's my end game. Not just this one home, but all the homes in your lifetime and your mother and brother and family, right? So that's one I'm asking for the referral right up front. I talk about it all the time. I ask specifically for three referrals. You know, I want to make you so happy you can't help but refer me three of your friends. That's my goal. So obviously, I'm gonna, you're allowed to cancel this agreement. And I'm going to want you out and on your way because I really do care and I want you to find a home that you like. Right. So that's how I get around those three things. So either you're 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 not checking a box, which means it's a uh, non-exclusive representation or you check the box and you decide to on um, item number two. Right. And then you can let them know if they get uncomfortable with it. Hey, look, if you come and you find something or it doesn't work out, you have a right to be able to cancel this. OK, and so then you guys have any questions so far, because I know I talk fast. No. Nope? OK. So can you guys understand and see the value of explaining this to a buyer that one, either you choose, it's exclusive, non-exclusive, you have your timeframes in place, you have a, you have to have a commission amount, you can change it if you want, can't go up, but it can go down, right? Unless you mutually agree it's going to go up. That was the case, I'd be writing 50 on there. <laughs> Jerry, I have a question. When uh -huh. do you present this to them? When do I what? When do you present this document to your client? Do you have a new buyer? I get a relationship with them first. I don't just like sending them forms to sign. First, I want them to know me because I'm going to have a discussion with them. But it's ideally, I like it as soon as possible. That's what my answer is, as soon as possible. But I look at it as business-wise, it's going to be as soon as possible with the relationship that I have with a buyer. And if I can't get that, I'm just going to send it with an email explanation. So if I were to, let's say I, I called you up and I said, hey, Sherry, I heard you're in real estate. I want to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And then you would, we would have a conversation over the phone or I'd meet with you. Or you'd give me a buyer consultation or what? Just to make it more clear. Depending on, 
again, it depends on the conversation because I don't have a set in stone. I do this, I do that. I've shown buyers that have pre-calls. I've shown buyers that have not had pre-called because my whole thing is getting a relationship with that person, right? Making a friend. As soon as I can make a friend and find out what their needs are, then I start to go from there. So like if Barbara just said, you just called me, we're going to go show a home. I'd say, great, love to. What are the homes they are? Okay, fine. Hey, I'm going to send you a little form for you to sign in order for me to be able to show you those homes. And I'm going to make you those appointments. And you see, I'm just going to run right on along. This is what we normally do all day long. It's nothing new. Then if they start to question me about it or ask me more, I'm going to go into more details. Okay. And if, and my short answer is, right, because you should have an elevator speech for everything, right? So you guys all know what an elevator speech is. And that is, you got the length of time that you're in an elevator to express value or express whatever it is, right? So you got less than three minutes to explain this. Because trust me, when I first started this business, I would bore you to death of the details I would go in. And I realized, you know, not everybody wants that A-type personality complex answer. And, and it took my brother going, yeah, 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 where do I sign? Kind of like, shut up, just tell me where to sign. And I thought, man, I'm getting in the way of somebody signing. I better shut up. <laughs> so, the most common one, do you want to do the non-exclusive or the exclusive? So those are, that's your choice, okay? So non-exclusive means you can show them property just like you do right now. And that buyer is not locked into, if they find a home, they're going to pay you a commission. And the easier way to explain it is if you read like what it's right there in item two, really bold. It says the broker is entitled to compensation if the buyer acquires property during that representation period with or without your involvement, even if the other broker got paid. So that's exclusive, right? A lot of people put the brakes on and start backing up when they start to read that. What? What? And what I just explained is this is the way real estate has been handled for years, right? With procure, We called it procuring cause and all these other kind of things. But because of the lawsuit, now it's being spelled out. So pretty much I'm letting you know, um, I want to represent you when you find a home. You've already told me your story. I've already looked at this. I, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to tell them about the conversations that we previously had. I said, and I need to let you know if you want to get out of it right below that. The next very next line is the cancellation. If our relationship breaks down, this isn't a forever. It's not like a marriage and we have to get divorced and get attorneys. All you have to do is send me a cancellation. I want I want to know one thing on here that uh, that if that's the case. So in the scenario you gave us about your friend's son, if that agent had had him sign this and then when and had a list and then he fired her. But he she then within five days presented him a list of the problems that he had shown her. She might have had a right to that. Absolutely. Compensation. So you guys, that's the that's the the clue. The really big clue here is you need to read this because you need to read the if ands or buts about it so that you understand all of it. Sherry's giving us the e the very easy way to present it, but at the same time, you need to know absolutely what this means. Because even if you look up at the top, it says either you walked into a home with them, you virtually sent them the home. I mean, there's a lot of ifs there, so you really want to understand it so that you feel comfortable using it. And if there is a, a way out for a buyer, you know how to, again, still justify your compensation. So in that scenario where I had the person fire them, right? Had she had this form signed and box two was checked, she would have gotten a commission no matter what. Mm -hmm. right? So now I would have wanted to make sure then that when I followed up with her with an email, I would have asked her if she's going to be um, trying to um, to get that. Right. Or would so you would also ask your client if he had already signed something with her? Just I don't question. trust that ever. Yes, you should ask. They always say, yes, you should ask. But, you know, like they say, buyers are liars, right? So it's like, well, and but really, I don't think buyers are liars. I, what I really think is they don't know. And there's so much that they're learning, just like you guys being new agents. Like, look at all the stuff you're having to learn. The last time I talked to a buyer, he's like, his head was just spinning. He goes, I never thought I'd learned this much, Sherry you know, about roof inspections, about pest inspections, about contract, contract law, inspection mm -hmm. timeframes that they don't just end because the date goes by, right? You have to release them in writing. What is an earnest money deposit? Earnest money deposit? I mean, I have to spend more money, you know, all those kind of things. That buyer's head is spinning the whole time. Plus they got Aunt Betty and Grandpa Joe over here talking <laughs> to them about how that's about, you know, one of my day when I did, you know, they've got all of that white noise going on back there. And then there is no certainty of when they're actually going to get their keys or get to order that moving van until they get their keys. This last month, two days before we're supposed to close, buyer canceled. Yep. And it had, they could not get their loan, believe it or not. They couldn't. And the home that my client was buying, that buyer had already moved out. So oh. it, it's one of those things. That, and I, I tell people, that's why buying a home is so stressful because it's not for certain. If I could tell you when you were going to move and where you're going to move, it'd be easy. But it's not because there's too many variables. 
So that's the long answer for like what Barbara was saying is a lot of times when you ask a buyer, don't expect them to know everything or understand everything because they heard it once. Okay, and along that same tagline, I'm going to encourage you guys, don't just ask once for a referral, three times. My magic number is three. I'm going to ask them to send me three, and I'm going to tell them at least three times during that process. And the best time is when you're right with them and you're walking through the home, and you point out something to them about that home. They go, oh, I didn't know that. I said, that's because, remember, I want to make you so happy you can't help but refer me three of your friends. Right? So all the time going back into that. But like Barbara said, none of this matters if you don't read these forms. And these forms were reviewed by attorneys, but they were written by real estate agents. So you don't have to have a law degree to understand them, right? Now, I'm not saying I don't want you guys to not take the class that Barbara was saying, because even myself and my daughter, Rachel, were signed up to take the class because I want to learn some more of the ins and outs. But that's going to be an hours long class. And I want you guys to be prepared right now to be able to go out today and feel comfortable taking this form and having a buyer sign it today and having you choose Either I'm going to do non-exclusive representation, which is just at least do that. That's what you do now. Mm -hmm. Don't check box two, right? But if you want it to be exclusive, and that's what I want, I want box two, which means I'm just going to have a little bit more difficult conversations with buyers, right? So the other thing I wanted to point out that I highlighted is section D, which says accounting for payments to the broker, right? And basically what this is saying is... Um, this is kind of where I explain to the buyer, here's how I get paid by others and not you because they're going to be fixated on that line and scroll up just a little bit, Barbara, that buyer is going to be fixated on right there on item 4A1, right? That's that's their pocketbook. So when you scroll down, when you say item 4D1, uh, that's how I get paid, that you don't pay me, they do. And it's listed very clearly. And the new this new lawsuit did change so that you could even see on the MLS how much I'm going to get paid or my broker is going to get paid. Right. And then the other one on item three, we have a new line item in our, our um, offer, which also is in direct response to the lawsuit, which says, have you guys noticed that in the RPA where it says that you can negotiate right there that the seller is going to agree to pay you a specific amount? Right. So it's negotiable. Okay. Any other questions? And just for clarity, they do talk about that in the, the, the training class, and we're not really using it yet, but it could come up at some point. If you guys are in this business long enough, probably going to be there. <laughs> Hopefully I'm going to be out. <laughs> but uh, but so just know about it. You just need to be aware. It's always having that awareness of what's going on in our in our business. That, were you going to talk about item E as well, Sherry? Just on that, it's a blank um, number there. So I put in, that's what I put for my listing. Um, Agreement. I kind of misspoke earlier. When I do six months is the time frame for my contract. But on here, this additional broker right to compensation, that's what my listing agreement says, 120 days. I figured if a buyer has showed a home that I had listed 120 days later, I don't want them trying to cut me out of the deal if the neighbor came to the seller, right? They're going to have to wait. If they really want it and they really want to cut me out and be sneaky and sly, they're going to have to wait to do it. And the same thing with the buyer. However, every case is different. I may let somebody out sooner, right? It, you know, it's your business. You're free to do that. Um, that's one of the great things. Your business that you're creating has your ethics, right? has your professionalism. You decide. So I see there were two questions. John, are you still there? He was the first question. I don't know if he's still on. Yes, um, I'm still here. <clears throat> I just had a quick question. So I've noticed that like some real estate agents, they don't use this form because I remember when I bought my home last year, my agent didn't give me this form at all. She said that she didn't believe in this type of form. So like, mm -hmm. does that happen too? Yeah, see, like Barbara and I were telling you, this has been the way we've operated and done business without the form. And when I taught that new member orientation class, I talked to the agents about it, mm -hmm. right? So this is when you just get your license and you're joining your association. The association is talking to you about all kinds of different things. And we went over this form, but nobody's used it. Nobody. I, I would say it's probably like maybe 5% of the people do. Why didn't put nobody, why do people sway away from it though? Um, It's... Honestly, like for me, it's because I felt like if I didn't do my job and you went somewhere else, then I just didn't do my job. I see. So but I think people didn't use it, John, because it felt uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But Sherry pointed out, you know, we have when we take a listing, we have no problem telling them that we're we need to be paid. So this is basically just the opposite of that. We're sharing with our buyers that we're not doing this for free. We need to be paid. And this is us showing their commitment to working with us and our commitment to working with them. So because of this lawsuit 
and all the, the talk out there, they are really highly recommending us to start using this. So whether your agent used it a year ago or whether I used it two weeks ago, that's not the case. Going forward, we encourage you to use this form with your buyers. So John, have you guys heard the story about the meatloaf and the thing of when the grandmother first started to make her meatloaf, she put it in a pan that was like this big. And when she made it, she had to cut the ends off to get it to fit in the pan. So when her daughter made meatloaf, she cut the ends off to put it in the pan. And when her daughter went to make the meatloaf, her pan was this big and she cut the ends off to put it in the pan. It's kind of like the way we've always done things doesn't necessarily fit in what today is. And so the way we used to do business was we thought everybody knew how we got paid as a buyer's agent. It was just one of those things. It had gone on forever. Why talk about it? Because they knew I'm not doing it for free. I'm getting paid. They knew we were getting paid by the seller. So now this lawsuit has come around to say, no, the public is not informed. And it is our job to explain to them how we get paid. So one of the first things that happened was all offers of compensation is posted in the MLS and it's public knowledge now. Before it was hidden, you, the public didn't know like what amount of compensation the seller was offering to a buyer's agent. Now across the United States, all MLSs now show what the offer of compensation is for a buyer's agent. And so now we're going one step further and it is new and you guys would not have heard a lot about this before because we just didn't talk about it. It was like the assumed and the known. Well, now it's not, we're operating under the assumption that you don't know. Real estate agents have always, oh, hi guys. Um, real estate agents have always worked as of they just ass assumption, right? But you wouldn't go, you wouldn't go shopping for something, take it to a register and pay for it without knowing the price first, right? So all it is, is they know that your compensation, you're being compensating somehow um, as a lender, our disclosures, our estimates that we send out, we always show the amount that we are paid for our services. You guys, they don't write back. It's just a disclosure to let them know what your services are. So do not be afraid of this form because you're good at what you do. You know what you do. You've got a team that's going to help you through it. It's just a disclosure to help you guys and how you present it to them. Um, that's, that's what matters, right? Yeah. You just have to show your value as well. Um, and I think Sherry talked about that as well. Patrick, you had your hand up for a question. Did you still have a question? Yes, I just wanted to clarify something you said, Sherry. Um, you had referenced a previous transaction you did where the client, you asked them to send a text and fire their current agent so you could help them with the Valley Springs. Mm -hmm. And then you had said if they, if the previous agent had had this form with the number two box checked, they would still be entitled to compensation. Is that still even after the firing portion? Yeah, because you have to look at the, it would so you see now it depends on how the form was filled out. Okay. Because there's there's spots in here that are, are open, right? If that agent, let's go down just a little further, Barbara. If that agent, like where it says, where it C, item C says that they can cancel. So let's just say he canceled and, and it was in writing. And right. at this point, like after he, now this was before this, this was a conversation before this form. This was a year and a half ago. Okay. So now that we have this form, I'm going to do things a little differently, right? Because it's not just a simple fire and I'm going to have to make sure that they put it in writing. And as a side note, you guys, I've created those for my buyers to copy and paste and send to their agent because they don't like doing it, right? Nobody likes to break up. So um, if that agent had filled this out and on item E, if she put zero, she wouldn't have been entitled to any of it. Got it. See? But if okay. she put 120 days, we would have had to wait 120 days or I would have had to make sure that she's just going to bow out and not, not expect to get paid on a home. But she really was not the procuring cause. And see, and that's where I was going back to. Um, and you guys, I've sat on a few grievance committees where there have been claims on compensation, right? Of who's going to get paid because somebody thinks that they were the procuring cause. And there's not just one factor. It's multiple things that goes to show procuring cause. And it's not who wrote the offer, right? That's not the procuring cause. It's not necessarily who showed them the home. There's a lot of things that come into play. And it's complicated. <laughs> And if you ever get in that position, you guys are going to want to call Barbara or or um, call the broker, broker and the legal hotline. So, but good question, Patrick. Is there anything on page two we need to address, Jerry? Not really. I've looked through the rest of it. It's just, you guys really should, like, it's one of those things I feel like if this is your profession, you should at least read it. I mean, it was ingrained in me from day one when I started way back when, read it. And it was almost like my broker told us, before you ask me a question, I'm going to ask you, did you read it? And when I was a broker of my own company, that was one of the first things I asked my agents. Did you read it? Have you read through the RPA? Have I ever told you guys to do that? 
Yeah. Anybody? Have you, and yeah. the same thing with this. Have you read through this, right? And I, I'm, because it's new, even though our PA is newer, like it's a couple years old, I still have to go back and reread because they moved certain items. But, you know, even with this, I've reread it a couple times. So I'm refreshed with it enough. It's like, yep, I'm confident. So ask me a question on it. I don't know the whole thing. I'm not an expert on it. And so if I get, here's another trip too for you guys. If you get tripped up like that, because some people love to do that. Well, what about that? Let me pick something. Uh, personal financial information. Say, hang on a second. Which I, I ask him, where in there, where specifically are you um, asking about that? And then they'll tell me it's item uh, 7B. So then I'll go to item 7B and I'll read it instead of just giving them an answer on the fly. Now, if I know it, like some of the disclosures, I've gone over them so much. I know exactly what order they are in. I know exactly what they are. But in this case, you need to be able to answer your clients. So if they have a question, ask them specifically where in it or what is it? And then you can go back. And a lot of times I've just read what it says and ask them, do you understand it now? Or does that make more sense? Does that explain it better than I could? Because it's pretty clear and simple. It's written in um, uh, layman's, terms. layman's terms. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Um, to get the contracts, where do you where do you find them to like view them? Because I know you sent us the homework assignment to um, fill out. So the so Trey's new. So and we just haven't talked yet, Trey. So did you get signed up for car.org now? Um, I I believe so. I'm not for okay. sure. So but we'll make an appointment. But it, we have you have you when we when we met the first time. I told you you'd get username and password for two sites, MetroList and CAR.org, and all the contracts are in CAR.org. Okay. I'll double check. And... Okay. I can, you can call me and we can talk about that a little more. So okay. all the forms though, like Barbara's saying, is in there, and they, they have them categorized and alphabetized, like, and they're really beefing up on their property management stuff. Um, so there's all those forms in there, commercial property, they're all in there. Um just so you all know, before that question comes up, we cannot do, um, we do not do rentals Probably, or leases. Yeah. Um, Sherry can, because she's a broker and she has her own side business, I believe still as that. Do you still have property management? We do. Yeah. Okay. But just so, so she, you guys know, be careful because I hear it all the time. Agents will tell me, well, it was my mom's property. So I just collected her rent. I helped her find a tenant. And I'm like, oh, what's your license number? <laughs> yeah. And, and I have, I'm just saying that facetiously because I honestly, I've never turned anybody in. But you it, can only, yeah, you can only property manage for your own, your own stuff. Yeah. But you can't I do it. <laughs> I had a client that told me she lived across the street, didn't have a license. And she's talking, and I said, you are doing licensed. Behavior. I said, did you tell somebody how many bedrooms were in there? She goes, well, yeah. She goes, and I collected the rent. And I did this. And I said, do you know, you have to have a real estate license. I said, now I'm not going to turn you in or anything, but just so you know, I don't want you to go to jail. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And we do also commercial is a, is a special entity and you have to have the training in order to do commercial property. So just to knock that question out too. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Any other questions for Sherry? No. Nope. So, are more than welcome to Barbara, if you want to give them my cell phone number. Okay. I'll put that in the um, chat. I actually have a question. This is Shanita. Um, Sherry, you mentioned that you would um, have your, the potential client send a uh, text message to the previous uh, agent, uh -huh. do you have like a template we could use for that? I don't have a template because every scenario is different. Like if you're asking somebody to fire someone, um, and there's been a few times that I've had to ask a few people to fire who they were working with. Um, one was a listing agent. And I knew, I told the client, I said, ethically, I cannot call you. They have an exclusive right to that listing and I can't talk to you. However, you can call me like you did, but you notice I didn't call you. And they were having ethics issues with the listing agent. So they they asked me to list the home because I was the only one that did not want to be unethical and to talk to them about getting the listing. So you really have to look at, there's no one size fits all. But if you ever want to call and talk to me, I can help you with it. Um, and that case scenario that I used about text messaging, right now I know that with this new form, it's not going to be enough. But that for me is going to be the hardest thing is to get buyers to fire agents because that's kind of what we're talking about, right? I'm kind of saying it kind of bluntly. We're wanting them to fire their agent to see. So then I'm going to have to ask further questions now is, have you signed a form with him? Do you know if it's exclusive or non-exclusive? And there, I know he would have said, I don't know. I signed something. We wrote an offer somewhere. I know that's exactly what Garrett would have said. I said, well, do you, could you show it to me? Go ahead and just show me the stuff. Well, you know, 
he was a cowboy. I couldn't get him off the horse long enough to go, you know, barely even go look at property. So I just, you just, you know who you're working with. It's not always the ideal situation. So in that case, if it was today and I asked him to text them that, I would have created an email for him to send to her in writing and ask him, hey, Garrett, here's an example of what you could say. I wouldn't be directing him to do that or to say, you have to do this, but here's an example. Could you send it to your agent? As soon as you do, I'm going to be able to help you. And it would have been something short and sweet saying, this is notice that I no longer, that I wish to cancel the BRBC dated 11, 15, 23. Gotcha. Yeah. And if we were on the receiving end of that, mm -hmm. have we submitted maybe a list of properties that we've shown them previously um, that would offer some level of protection? So, in, yeah, in, in the form itself, it talks about that's our obligation then. So, like, mm -hmm. if they cancel an agreement and you want to get paid for some properties that you've shown him, our obligation is to send that list. Within five days. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions? I put Sherry's phone number. Oops, I put 2099. Um in the it's 209 in the um con in the chat. Mm -hmm. It's 209-679-2042. Um and so thank you so much, Sherry. This really was very helpful. And if anyone wants to send me a a, a draft of one of these, and uh, I'll take take a look at it, make sure you did it right, just a pretend one. Mm -hmm. Um I also sent out an RPA scenario. I had one person even ask me about it. That was um Star, anybody else see that? I seen it. I, I still need to. Um, I, I do plan to um send you one of my uh to fill it out and send it to you. So I'll get that to you as soon as I can, Barbara. Okay. All right. Yeah. Please send it to me, you guys, so I can review it. I sent it to you so you could do a practice um contract, and then I will review it. And there, you'll see there's a little note at the bottom. If you send it to me, basically blank. I'm not going to review it. You have to read through it and do your best to fill it out. Okay. Or, and, or you can watch Bruce's video on YouTube where he walks through the RPA and you can use that as a, to help you, but please don't send me a blank form with just like the name and the date. I'm sending it back. I, I want to just put that out there. Cause that's, that's not an attempt. That's not a try. That's just a, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> and I've gotten them like that. So that's the only reason I'm saying I speak from experience. So um, anyway, thank you so much, Sherry. Um, I think we're at the 1.30. Oh, big announcement. We do not have a meeting next Wednesday. It's the day before Thanksgiving. I'm hopefully going to be starting to do some food cooking and all that fun stuff. And so, uh, and I know the office has kind of canceled things as well. So please, I will not be here next Wednesday. So don't plan to be here. I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We will be here the Wednesday following. I'll send out reminders. Um, we're probably going to have a speaker from the title company come on and talk about farming how you can, she can help you set up um, farming areas so you can reach out with emails, really good stuff. Um, not the title company, I'm sorry, she's a lender. Um, so please uh, plan to be here for that. And yeah, that's it. I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And Sherry, thank you very much. Thank you, awesome. Sherry. Awesome. Happy welcome, Thanksgiving, everybody. Barbara. Thank you. Quick picture, quick picture. <laughs> I tried some before, but let's let everyone smile. I know. I'll send I, I, have one, I have one more picture. question, actually. Yeah, wouldn't you know it? <laughs> okay, one, one, two, three. Again? Okay, cool. Thank you so much. I have, a, I have we, one more we, question. Oh, come actually. now you show up. <laughs> okay. Anyway, everyone have a great day. Everybody has a question. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. I have, I have a question. question. Um, where is, what is the YouTube channel of the RPA uh, walkthrough that Bruce did? I'll say it's the, um, I don't know it exactly. It's uh, KW Premier, but I'll tell you what, I'll send it in an email right now to everyone. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Have a good okay. Thanksgiving, everybody. All right. Good Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.